Okay, um, this is a fairly intense session. We have, this is the national program session. We have two talks, or one talk, one panel session. So the first talk, I'm acutely aware of the, the, the time limitations, so I'll be brief, is from Chris Bolling, who's going to talk about an initial review of the activities of the newly established supercomputing technology applications program at IVEC. And then after this, we have 20 minutes for a collection of people who have been told one minute to overview your project and then Q&A and interrogation from the community at large. This is the, how much we can interrogate them in 20 minutes remains to be seen, but I hand over to Chris. Hi. Uh. Okay. All right. Hi, my name's uh, Chris Boarding. I'm with uh, IVIC. I'm one of the new members of the uh, staff team within IVEC. Uh, we're a new group. We're six months on or so, and we're going to talk about uh, what we've been doing since we've started up our group. Uh, thanks, uh, real quick, uh, thanks for the e-research uh, Australasia conference sponsors and everyone uh, showing up and everyone for attending. Thank you. Uh, so IVEC's goal is to foster and promote research in an uptaking of, uh, in the uptake of supercomputing, large-scale data storage, visualization in, in Western Australia and beyond. This is achieved by making the facilities available and expertise in the research, education, and the industrial communities. Um, IBIC is made up of a group of five partners. We have the four universities in Western Australia and CSRO. The universities are Edith Cowan, Curtin University, and Murdoch University, and University of Western Australia. And our resources are dispersed across all of Perth, good or bad, that's, that's kind of where things are right now. We just needed places to put things at, in the beginning, so this is how it kind of happened. And we are funded by the, the partner memberships in the state and the federal government. The average computing resources are um, allocated based on the merit-based allocation schemes through uh, IVEC and the National Science, the NCI calls, and uh, uh, Aztec and NCMAS. And we have five, basically five groups that we uh, distribute our resources across. Astronomy, geosciences, they get half. The partner share is 30%, national is 15%, and the director share is 5%. So we're here to talk about why we have a staff team at IVIC. So the, the Palsy Project Center, um, through the Palsy Project, IVIC is growing, IVIC is rapidly growing capacity. In 18 months, we've gone from five teraflops to 160 teraflops. Right now we have two, two resources, compute resources, Epic and Fornax. Epic is our large Linux cluster with 9,600 cores, and Fornax is our large GPU cluster with 96 uh, GPU nodes. And so we've gone from five teraflops to 160 teraflops plus, which is a 32-fold increase in our compute capacity. And those represent, uh, Fornax and Epic represent uh, Palsy 1A and 1B. And what uh, the, the Palsy Center really is, is going to petascale. So how do we, so we're going to go, we're going to add another six-fold increase in our compute capacity to the research community. So we have to be able to upscale our, our resources. We're upscaling our resources, so we have to upskill and upscale our user community and their codes to be able to, have, to, to use these resources. Now, the IVEC staff team was created to support IVEC's uh, mission to do this. And it consists of, uh, right now we have seven people. Uh, Paul Ryan has uh, stepped in for Daniel Grimwood 
because he's been seconded to the policy procurement project. But it's uh, led by George Beckett, myself, uh, Daniel Grimwood, Chris Harris, Rebecca Hartman Baker, Paul Ryan, and Nicola Verini. And these positions are all funded by the Western Australian government and the IVIC partners. And the Supercomputing Technology and Application Program is what STAP actually stands for. Uh, and we're here to help people, our user communities and the researchers get more from their supercomputing. Whether it's um, accessing, the, you know, for some people it's accessing the facilities and resources, for others it's understanding what supercomputing is and parallel programming, com computational science, GP GPU programming, scientific visualization, data intensive computing. And our tasks, our day-to-day -day tasks were broken down into five different areas. Uh, we, we support the help desk at IVIC. We do outreach, response uh, to uh, user queries and, uh, and events. We do training and we do collaborative uh, projects with uh, researchers. Ideally, we want to spend 50% of our time doing collaborative projects. That's where the big benefit is, is because we want to spend, well, for us as the staff team, that's our big interest in being able to develop these large scale, large codes that can scale and are parallel. The benefits of STAP to IVIC. The STAP team is helping IVIC transition from a, to a national and international facility. We're helping the IVIC develop the operational policies and practices for the center. We're supporting IVIC training program to increase the frequency of training, the quality of the course material, and develop new courses, especially with the GP, GPU courses. The material is constantly changing, so we want to keep that up to date, that and visualization, and just general scientific computing in general with those aspects, because a lot of our researchers, whether Experts in their fields, they're not all the best programmers, as most of us know. We have to help them, and we want to show them the best practices. And we're working hand-in-hand -hand with the technical operations group to make the uh, systems more user-friendly. Um, the majority of the staff team has come from other HPC centers. So we have a lot of experience in running these large, large systems and working with large communities. And with that knowledge, we want to leverage that knowledge that we have and establish best practices and show people how to do things efficiently and smartly on the computers. And we've also been helpful, we've also enabled, well, we've also steered IBIC in purchasing some more hardware and the software resources that we do support and maintain on the system. <coughs> Petascale on the IBIC community, this is our big challenge. Petascale com uh, computing is gonna be hard it's going to be time consuming and it's going to be complex. Uh, there's no petascale codes in our user community. We have to develop those and we have to support our users in developing those things. Uh, sorry. Oh, sorry, I'm too far. Uh, the challenges for the staff team include community awareness. That's our, one of our biggest problems is we're new. Nobody knows who we are. Some people don't even know who IVIC is. So we need to identify, we, need to re, we have to go out and shake the trees and let people know who we are, what we can do, and what we're here to help them do. Um, the, the problem is, is we have a very large community. We're across four different universities. There's only seven of us, well, six of us. Uh, and so to get across four different universities and, a research center, and the research centers there just in Perth alone is a very time consuming and challenging task. The other thing is, is how do we identify users' issues and challenges? We have lots of users who are currently already on the system. Our systems are both running uh, flat out. But how do we identify if a user has an issue, if they don't know they have an issue? Uh, how do we identify projects that need supporting? Uh, how do we engage users into using supercomputing? We have lots of, lots of people, lots of different universities again, and we want to be able to have them uptake the uh, resources. How do, we, how do we engage with them? And how do we make them think bigger? 
you know, lots of small things. They're happy to do things on their workstations, but how do we get them to do things on a supercomputer? And how do we get them to think that they can do, realize that they can use these resources effectively and do things on supercomputers? So far, we've uh, we've done pretty good in the, in the brief time we've been here. We've had the staff team. We've we've enabled uh, quite a bit of. We've had some uh, well good success with a few users. Uh, we've had our first job, first user to run a million jobs on our on our uh, Epic cluster. And uh, Jonathan Horner from uh, University of New South Wales. He's running an orbital dy orbital dynamics code. He's run a million jobs uh, on the system. And we have uh, Professor uh, Ling Kwing Nguyen, uh, who's doing gravity waves detection on GPUs running on Fornax, and they're up over a million CPU hours for that project. And uh, Professor Paolo Rattari, doing uh, reactive geochemistry with lamps, he's over five million CPU hours on the system. Now these are good results, but we have to kind of balance these two things together. How do we want lots of people running lots of little jobs, or do we want just a few people to dominate the entire machine. So there's a balance that we have to work with and help people understand how these resources, because these are shared resources, and make effective use for both extremes of our communities. So, and yeah, this is a, you can see how one user has uh, skewed the results for the number of jobs out of our astronomy community. So a million jobs. This is 1.4 million jobs. And so he's run one, and so that's the bar. He's, he's pretty much all of the bar. So our goal, and, it's, and it's, it's, it's pretty much the same across our user community as it is at a lot of HPC centers, lots of small codes. That's our geoscience uh, user community. It's good. They're doing fantastic work. We're getting lots of stuff done. but. You know, we want to get big parallel codes. We want to do things faster, you know, that use bigger, bigger resources and do bigger models and help them do big science. That's the goal. Um, and then there's their partner shares. Again, the same thing. Now, these, uh, these, these, these charts are a little bit skewed uh, because they don't really, they're not that informative uh, and they're very subjective uh, metrics. We don't really show we show lots of small jobs, but we don't really see what the CPU hour usage is per, the job, per job of the jobs that are running big parallel codes. And, that, and that's actually more interesting to us, but we want to show that you know, we're, this is the challenge that we have. We want to shrink these bars in the small queue and make the, those, those uh, bars grow in the uh, work queues and the large queue. But we want to show lots of thousands of CPU jobs uh, a year from now. So we have uh, some current projects that we're working on right now. These are ongoing projects that people are using the resources for. Um, Bushfires and Autodoc. Uh, so we have, there's a, a, a project uh, using about bushfires, and we're using Autodoc code. It's to uh, smoke from bushfires contains compounds that stimulate that stimulate germination and dormant seeds. These compounds are known as keratins. The protein is a classic sarin hydrolyzed enzyme which suggests that, which suggests that it is responsible for an enzymatic reaction in the pathway of keratin perception, okay, which is a lot. <laughs> all right. So that's, the, that's their goal. Their, their goal is to do this project, all right. The, the application is autodocrina. We want we to identify using a consensus chemistry within identify a consensus of chemistry within the plant enzyme molecule, and they're going to analyze 220,000 naturally occurring compounds. Fantastic. Okay, so this is a structural biology project done by uh, Rohan Blyfield Douglas. He's a PhD candidate at UWA. The requirement is to analyze 220,000 compounds with Autodoc. Actually, he's using, I mean, I'm sorry, Autodoc Vina. The problem is he's new to scripting, and what's, he wants to know, what's our help to do, what's the best way to do this? So we have two issues. 220,000 small jobs on our, on our big Linux cluster is not very practical. Um, and the other problem is it turns out once we talked to him was that 
He had downloaded the Autodoc binary from the Autodoc developers, which is not tailored to our system. So the solution was, after we talked to him, we showed him how to break the data sets into smaller chunks. We haven't worked out what the best, what's the sweet spot. Is it 1,000? Is it 500? Is it 1,000? Is it 5,000 compounds in a directory and have him run one job per directory? But we did also recompile his code, and we got it to speed up about 40 percent. And on 220,000 jobs, a million CPU, a million CPU minutes or so per, for the whole run. So we just knocked off a couple, a couple hundred thousand CPU minutes, which is real computer time, for somebody else to do something very interesting too. Another project that we have going is the hyperdata, hyperspectral data fusion. Uh, at, at CSRO, there's a group, the, the 3D Mineral Mapping Center of Excellence. They're using airborne hyperspace, hyperspectral sensing uh, to, is used to accurately map mineral composition on the surface. Um, and they're taking this hyperspectral airborne data and they're fusing this data, doing data fusion with the drill core sample data that's collected and doing a hyperspectral drill core data analysis. And they are generating images like this. And it's hard to see, but the vertical lines in the middle of the plot are all the drill cores. And they're taking all the, the drill core data and they're merging this together. And this is the Rockley Dome Channel Iron Deposit located in WA. Uh, this is a case study. This is. This is a case study that they use to evaluate the geoscience products created by this group. So they, they know this area very well and the data involved very well. And they integrate both the surface and subsurface data to target channel iron deposits. The data fusion combining high map data with uh, the drill core data to identify the different mineralogical zones. So they're looking for channel iron ore deposits. And channel iron ore deposits make up 40% of all the iron ore Mind and must mind, period, which is seven, uh, which makes up some 700. I mean, sorry, 7,000 million tons, is what they estimate is in these channel iron ore deposits. So there's real economic value in understanding where to dig. Okay. Current future challenges for this uh, for the center of 3D mineral mapping. The big challenge for them is they have no experience in HPC. So they have to move their, their workflow from an HPC environment I mean, to, a work, to an HPC environment from, work, from a workstation. So that means they have to re, redo their workflow. That means they have to get rid of their IDL developed GUI to set up their jobs. And then they have to make some sort of command line tool so that we can run things in a batch mode. And so, and then we can do things in HPC. And we're about halfway through this process. The future challenges for them is that the next generation scanners are going to go up on satellites. The next generation scanners are going to generate terabytes of data. And now, so instead of having just a few disks for a whole survey, they're going to have a few, instead of a few DVDs, they're going to have a few disk drives to make up all their data. So they need to be able, they have a, they have a need and a, and a requirement. The need is that they have all this data requirement and that they need to share and be able to share. And they have the requirement is, is they're going to just not be able to do their work on a workstation at some point. And the roadmap for the future. A lot of our researchers need supercomputing support. Uh, it's hard. Supercomputing is difficult. They have different workflows. They're all doing different things. They're all very interesting people with a limited amount of time to invest in this, and they want to get the maximum out of it. So we're formalizing, formalizing processes for the help desk. Merit allocation time, allocation, merit based allocations. And we're collaborating with three defined projects. And we're looking for greater engagement with specific groups. We're targeting outreach, uh, targeting expert groups, 
and creating expert groups. We have a large uh, open foam community and we want to develop a large expert group for open foam because we have open foam users at four different institutions. And it would be all it would be very nice if we were able to get everyone in sync. The uh, the greater engagement with, the specific, with specific groups, one of the uh, things we're trying is we're embedding the, re the staff team within supercomputing groups. It's possible for you to have one of us come work for you, work with you, not for you, work with you for several months on a part-time basis and help you m m migrate your codes and workflows. And the next, in the next training, we want to create the next level of training. We want to get beyond, here's a supercomputer, here's the introduction to supercomputer, here's the introduction to uh, parallel programming. We want to, we want to have more in-depth courses for the, the GPU courses, OpenA, OpenAC, uh, MPI, hybrid parallelization, performance studies, using the, using the tools that you're going to need to use and understand how to use to develop large petascale codes. And lastly, I th we believe that, yeah, we think the staff team is making a positive difference to IVEC and to, the, to our user community. And that's, uh, that's it. So thank you very much. Tom Morris here from CSIRO. You've got four universities in your partnership. Why aren't you actually sort of working with them and outsourcing your training to them? After all, they are universities. But, uh, well, the universities have different requirements. Uh, right now, we're just trying to focus, a lot of the training was focused on just on a very introductory level. Here's the, here's the system. We have a training course on Here's, here's Linux. This is Unix. Uh, this is what a supercomputer is. And then um, there are courses there, and we're working with some of them on helping them understand some of the resources, but uh, we don't have a, uh, a plan. I don't, I don't know the plan for the training. There's a, there's a different group. For, we have a, an education project manager, program manager, who is dealing with those kinds of things. Um, and yeah, yeah we, just, we, we have limited resources to do everything. And now, why we don't leverage them more, um, we, that's, the good, that's a good question. OK, I guess we can thank the speaker. All right. All right thank you. Thank you.